So hello, my name is Jess Sainsbury. I am uh, the Florence Nightingale Foundation's Head of Nursing and Midwifery Engagement. It is an absolute pleasure to have you all with us here uh, for this webinar this afternoon. A bit of housekeeping um, before we start. So you're already doing it, but if you could please introduce yourselves using the chat function, let us know who you are and where you are, um, where you are from. And if you have any social media handles as well, please do include those and we will give you a cheeky follow back. So for our audience members, um, I know we've probably been doing online meetings for some time now, um, but if you could um, pop yourselves on mute, um, during the, the content, there will be some interactive elements of the webinar and we will be encouraging you to get involved in discussion. At that point, you'll be prompted to unmute. It's completely up to you whether you leave your camera on or not. We always absolutely love to see your faces, though, but I understand that sometimes our uh, environments don't allow it or even our bandwidth um, on the Internet, too. But it would be lovely to see you. Um, as I said, there will be opportunities for discussion um, during the webinar and you'll be prompted for those. But if you do have any comments, thoughts, questions, again, please use that chat function and we will have some time at the end to ask those too. You will have been notified when you entered that we are recording this session and that's so that we can share it afterwards. Um, so if you don't want your face to be on the recording, um, please do switch your camera off and let us, the team at FNF, know um, if you've got any problems with that and we will um, deal with that for you. We would also encourage your thoughts to be shared on social media. We'll pop the handles um, in the chat function for you so you can tag uh, the Care Leaders Association, Howard, and obviously FNF as well. Um, so we'll pop those in there and uh, encourage that online engagement afterwards. And please do share the recording once it becomes available. So I think that's all my housekeeping done. So today's webinar is Care Leavers, A Hidden Health Inequality. Um, and I won't steal the thunder of our brilliant presenters, but I'll give them a brief introduction before I hand over. So we are joined today um, by Jim Goddard, who has been the chair of the Board of Trustees of the Care Leavers Association since 2010, and has been actively involved with the association since 2001. He's also a recently retired academic, having worked at the University of Bradford from 1998 to 2021 and his final seven years at Bradford he was the head of division for sociology and criminology in the school of social sciences he's also the author of numerous publications on issues affecting looked after children and adults who were in care as children absolute pleasure to have you with us today Jim and we also have Howard Howard um, has worked in the NHS for 30 years with experience in nursing health visiting public Public health and operational management. He's currently the Associate Director of Quality and Safety in Sussex Community NHS Foundation Trust. Howard was in care in the 80s and talks openly and honestly about his experience and what it means for him as a care leaver. Howard is currently involved in a new group supporting NHS staff who are care leavers, the Care Experienced Peer Group. You can see both the logos there of um, the organisations on the screen. And um, the Care Experience Peer Group recently developed three videos sharing stories from NHS staff who are care experienced and how it was honoured to be featured. And we'll pop that link in there for you as well. So that's a resource in the chat for everyone. Howard is also, and we are super proud of this, an FNF alumni, and his project focused on exploring care leaders' health as an inequality and is now passionate about increasing awareness within the NHS. And as part of the FNF webinar, he will share his story. So I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to our absolutely fantastic presenters. Over to you both. Brilliant. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Jess. Can I just um, uh, explain to anybody looking at the slide? Um, David Graham was going to be with us today. He's our national director. Um, he's currently up in Glasgow. He's actually working on an another health related project for the CLA. So that's why you've got myself and Howard. I'm basically David as well for the purposes of this presentation. Sorry, carry on, Howard. Lovely. Thanks, Jim. Um, so if we could have the next slide, please. Brilliant. So first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us this afternoon. And it's an absolute pleasure, pleasure and a real privilege as well for us both to be here. And uh, thank you as well to the FNF for hosting us. Um, and the topic we're talking about this afternoon 
uh, which you've all signed up for, is care leave is a hidden health inequality. And it's something that we're all really passionate about. And I think that I just want to flag here um, the quote from the NHS plan. So we've been thinking about this as an inequality since the NHS plan. We know that the most vulnerable children who need extra help to support them don't always get that support or the services are not there to meet their needs. We're going to be exploring this afternoon about how that can result in poorer health outcomes, particularly for care leavers. And I suppose I just want you to think about within the NHS as you're hearing the slides that we go through and the stories that you'll hear as well about what, what else can we be doing in the NHS? There's lots of great initiatives happening locally, but at a sort of a national level and sort of supporting across the NHS, what else could we be doing? Care leavers as well, you know, in terms of um, sort of exposure and being able to, you know, talk about this more. This is you know, fairly recent, really, in terms of the, this as an agenda. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of people would have seen the video at Christmas, uh, the John Lewis advert, um, which really was raising awareness of children in care. And I just wanted to start um, just by going back the clock a bit and just sharing that video first from uh, from John Lewis. So if we could just share the video. Hello, Mr. Yeah, we can't wait. We got in peace. We're really excited. Merry Christmas. All the small things, true care, the truth brings. Oh, you're okay. I'll take yeah, I'm one fine. Lift. Your ride, best trip. Always, I know you'll be at my show, watching, waiting. How did it go? Yep. Nailed it. Reading, say it ain't so. I will not go, turn the lights off, carry me home. Hey, Ellie. Hi. Oh, yeah. <laughs> skate a bit too. <laughs> you want to come in? Oh. Not as good as yours, I don't think. Oh, well, I just have a few stickers, that's all. Let me get some stickers for you. Brilliant, thank you. If we can have the next slide. So I shared that video because I think that for me, it was um, really empowering to see that on national television. The first time I think that we've seen an advert which is showing a child in care and also, you know, them, you know, starting their new life there with their foster family. So this afternoon, what we're going to do is go through some of the key data and research, uh, which Jim's going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to look at um, some personal testimonies as well from the research. Um, starting to think about some of those issues and solutions. And I'm also going to share my own story, which I think is really important that we talk about our stories in an empowering way. You know, our past does affect who we are now and it's how we look to the future. And I'm really passionate about sharing that and, and in terms of the positive outcome of my life. And also then want to think about what is it that we all are going to commit to today? Next slide. Okay, so this is uh, um, my introduction very, very briefly to the Care Leavers Association. Um, uh, as Jess um, mentioned, I've been chair for all oh, since 2010, but the CLA has been going for another 10 years before that. We started in 2000. And we are, for, as it says there, for care leavers of all ages. 
Um, so we go from 18 to 80 and beyond. In fact, we've got some very elderly members. Um, we are user led. And what, what that means is that all of our trustees, our board of trustees, have been in care. Uh, that includes me. Um, I didn't put it in my bio. I, I should have put it in there, actually. Um, I was in care in the 1960s and 1970s, so a very, very long time ago. Um, most, Almost all of our staff have also been care experienced. Um, a, a bit about what we mean by care experience here, although I think most of the audience will be very, very, very well aware of this. It's predominantly children who were raised in foster care or residential care. Now, historically, residential care figured very prominently in the care system um, in, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. It's now a very, very small part. Um, uh, I think it's something like 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of children in care are now in foster care in families in the kind of family, hopefully, that you saw in the video. Um, uh, a few points about our engagement with this area of work, um, which is probably worth you um, bearing in mind. When I looked at the, the list of people who would put their names down to, to, to come to the session today, um, it was really, for me, quite exciting because we've done a lot of work with health professionals in the last few years. And it's always good to talk to health professionals who who already work with or have experience of working with care leavers. And obviously a lot of you have. I should say my view of this is that there's a lot of talk now, both in the health service and elsewhere, about the importance of lived experience. And I know that sometimes professionals can feel that lived experience is being prioritized over their professional expertise. Um, and for me, that's not, that's not the case at all. I think in professional expertise and qualifications in health and in other areas are really important. What's really important for us is the dialogue between people's lived experience um, of, in this case, healthcare and health issues and the professionals who, who seek to provide care for them. One or two other contextual factors. Uh, Howard's gonna talk about the, the actual numbers involved a bit later on um, and ask a few questions. But typically when we talk about children in care and adults who've been in care, we're talking about something between 0.5% and 1% of children. It varies a lot. Um, there was a big bulge, for example, in the numbers in care in the 1970s. There's another big bulge in England at the moment. Um, it does go up and down, but it's never. Re I, I don't think there's ever been a point at which it's been more than 1% of children and then, of course, 1% of adults. And that's quite important to bear in mind when we look at some of the figures for disadvantage, disadvantage amongst this group. Um, uh, we focus on the care system, but our good life after care is very important to us. What we mean by that is a good life right across the life course. Um, we campaign on a lot of issues that are led by our members, um, of which we have um, uh, several hundred signed up members and a lot of reach amongst thousands of care leavers. But there are hundreds of thousands. If you just do the maths from that 1% to 0.5% figure I gave you, you can work out that there are several hundred thousand people in the UK who were in care as children. Now, some of those, as the, the vast majority of you will already know, are in for relatively short periods. It could be um, a few months, maybe two or three years. Some are in care for the full 18 years um, of their childhood. It does vary tremendously. Um, uh, so I think that's probably as much as I, I, I want to say about the CLA at this point. Um, if there's anything I've forgotten, I'll doubtless come back, come back to it later on. Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so just want people just to spend uh, a minute and just think to yourself, you can just write it down if you want to jump into chat what you think about, you know, what some of these numbers are. But just want you to think about how many children do you think are in care? We've had a, if you've been clever, you might have seen a few things there in, in the video or from what Jim has just said as well. But just think, how many children do we currently have in care? How many children leave care each year? And then what percentage of care leavers are likely to die prematurely? And what percentage of the prison population do you think are care leavers? So I just want to just, just spend a minute and just think about some of those and what you think some of those numbers are. And don't worry, we'll then give you the, give you the answers. Oh, we've got a 20% a in the chat. Great. 
So should we go on the next slide? And then what we'll do is we'll start talking about what some of these. You can just go on to the next slide, please. OK, so this is some of the data. So um, you heard in the video earlier um, that, you know, th there's about 110,000 children in care in the UK, um, about 11,000 roughly around that in terms of leave care every year. So we're talking about, you know, quite large numbers of people here. But the impact of that, um, you know, we know that from research from longitudinal studies that you know this figure that 70 percent more likely to die prematurely up to age 45 so that was a 30-year longitudinal study and very similar to some other research that has been in the past as well and you know 24 percent of the prison population in england have spent time in care so you know why is that why is that happening so really high figures here in terms of the po homeless population, you know, 26% of the homeless population have care experienced. And this is why I'm particularly, and lots of us as well, are really wanting to raise awareness of this as a health inequality within the NHS. We talked earlier on and talked about the NHS plan, but actually, you know, are we really addressing this and thinking about this as a health inequality? Next slide. OK, um, uh, we're going to try not to give you too many uh, facts and figures um, because the really important uh, points here is the is the issues this raises for us all. Um, but as Howard said, there was quite a lot of evidence about the the, um, the disadvantages care leavers face. Um, but there's quite a lot of reasons for this, which I'll come on to in a short while. Um, low educational qualifications. A lot of young care leavers are in that, not in education, employment or training category. Um, as you can see there, 38% of 19 to 21 year olds. Um, I know I did some research years ago um, and I can I can tell you that we know a lot better, a lot more about that age group now than we did, let's say 20 years ago. Um, uh, before, I think before the last new Labour governments, we wouldn't have had pretty much any data on how 19, 20, 21 year olds were even faring. And the figures of the figure of 13% in higher education, um, they don't all go at 18. Uh, some of them go a bit later on. Um, that's compared to uh, well, well over 40%, I think it is now. Um, it's a lot better than it was um, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and we've already seen, as, 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 as Howard mentioned and somebody else has mentioned, they're very overly represented, overly represented in custody and homelessness data. Um, we did for our health project that um, we did, uh, which we'll come on to later on, uh, quite a lot of digging into what had already been done on this subject in terms of health issues. And we found 100 separate reports on this issue. Uh, but there are there, there is better data now, particularly in relation to older care leavers. Um, OK, um, we'll go on to the next slide, if that's OK. Um, now, I'm going to try and make this reasonably straightforward by, by telling you that, um, well, first of all, I noticed there's somebody with us, at least one person with us from Australia. So I'm hoping you're not, we're not disrupting your sleep, but, but thank you for joining us. You might be interested to know that the, the kind of framework that I'm outlining here, I developed it with an Australian academic, Sue Ellen Murray, some years back. Um, and just to make it simple to explain what's in, the, in, that, in those bullet points, it's basically a four-stage model of trauma that we're talking about. And it's really a, a way of conceptualizing um, uh, um, how we can think about uh, trauma and the care experience. And it's really dividing up into three potential arenas so that you can, you've got a simple aid memoir, as it were. First of all, it's important to recognize that large numbers of children, the majority of children, go into care um, due to abuse or neglect within the family home. Um, every year, the government producers looked after children statistics, um, and they contain usually a pie chart, which gives the reasons for entry into care. And for as long as I've been looking at these pie charts, 
it's always been over 50 percent obviously some of the other reasons like family breakdown etc um are can be equally traumatic but the, the, the by far the largest category is abuse or neglect within the within the family home so that means that the majority of children even before they enter care have experienced some very difficult and traumatic circumstances now the the, the second point is quite important that the, the the entry into care itself can be usually is very traumatic because even if it's entirely justified that these children are being removed from their home um, and in the vast majority of cases it clearly is nevertheless they're not just being remo being removed from the home they're being removed from their neighborhood the rest of their family um, very often their friends everything changes at once which is inevitably going to be very difficult. Then the third area of potential trauma, and this is where it becomes a lot more variable, is just to note that certainly in the care system of the past, and it may well be in the care system of the present, um, conditions can be incredibly varied. We know um, that there were there have been quite a few abuse scandals about the care system in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, because there are official reports detailing what went on, the recent uh, report into uh, child sexual abuse, um, which came out last year. Um, some of that was focused on what went on in children's homes in, for example, in Islington and London and elsewhere. A lot of the adults who lived through that experience are still with us. Um, they are here now. They are patients in the NHS. They are struggling to get on with their lives 20, 30, 40, even 50 years later. Uh, the fourth potential arena for trauma is simply the leaving care experience. Um, children typically leave the care system. It does vary quite a bit now, but 18 is the most common age. Some leave earlier, some leave later. But if they stay in care rather than go back to their families, then 18 is a typical leaving care age. Uh, and that's leaving care for independent life. Now, the average age of leaving home for independent life in this country is is 23 24 25 and the connections with parents very often remain lifelong so that early period of independence for example can be incredibly difficult it isn't always traumatic traumatic um but it can be if if people take the wrong path or things happen to young people um that uh, less less vulnerable young people are to some extent um in fact well in fact to a large extent protected from by their families so you add all of that together and it's very easy to see why uh, for example if you look at the adverse childhood experiences literature and there's a reference at the bottom of the slide there uh, young people from the care system are very very likely to score extremely highly um, and therefore according to that uh, literature to have adverse um, health experiences later in life. I, I just, as a, as a random example, uh, I did the checklist of adverse childhood experiences a while back, um, and I I ticked four before I'd even even got going, frankly. And, and that wouldn't be exceptional if you looked at those adverse experiences and you talked to most young people from the care system, they'd be ticking things uh, left, right, and centre. Um, so that's uh, enough on that slide. I'll pass over to Howard if we have the next slide. Thank you, uh, Jim. So I'm sure a lot of people might have seen this um, infographic, and um, this is the uh, approach in terms of reducing healthcare inequalities uh, within the NHS. Um, there's, a, there was, there's also one now that's been published recently for children and young people, and it very much is looking at what is the core 20% most deprived plus um you know um additional groups in terms of clinical conditions um and also then at a local level people can also identify population groups where the integrated care systems want to focus um and of course you know where we particularly want to be uh, championing and encouraging people to think about is care leavers at that local level at a system level working with providers in terms of thinking about um, care leavers 
as a population that should be looked at locally and it was brilliant as well just to see in terms of the chat where some people you know that is happening and I know that there's initiatives happening as well across the whole of the country so that's so that's great but really keen to um to, to link this with the inequality agenda and some of the conversations we've been having with NHS England in, in, uh, in the inequality of children and young people is looking at exactly what Jim was talking there about that that transition period between adult, between children and young people and adult, and how can we support that from the um, looked after children, children in care teams, and then moving into adult? Are we doing enough there or are there some gaps? Thank you. Next slide. Okay, uh, this, uh, um, uh, this kind of speaks for itself, uh, really, as uh, many of you will know, and I, I should say one of the pleasing things about when I looked at the audience uh, joining us today was to see the numbers of, of looked after children, nurses and, and health professionals specifically working with care leavers. I remember years and years ago doing some work in, in, in Bradford, um, which is where I worked on this subject and working with the looked after children nurse there, um, uh, both on situation of young teenagers but also uh, care leavers and it was a very rewarding experience because this was you know a health professional who clearly engaged with the this particularly uh, uh, vulnerable group um, and that was in the early days uh, when 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 before this uh, awareness spread spread um, there is I should say as well you'll get a list of references at the end um, I was going to try and put hypertext links, but a lot of the references you'll see when you get the full reference. These days, fortunately, unlike um, the old pre-internet days, you can Google these and you can download the full report. And I particularly encourage you to do that with some of them because they go into chapter and verse, particularly in relation to the lifelong issues facing many care leavers. Um, obviously, our bias as an organization is towards the the uh, the older end. And I should say that that uh, that's where there is now increasing recognition, um, but there's not a lot of work done on Kelly was over the age of 25, 26. They tend not to be the focus of discussion because there aren't really resources devoted to them, but it is fantastic that, that more resources are being devoted to uh, younger care leavers, um, uh, particularly um, uh, around mental health. Um, and I know that I know mental health in young people is a big issue generally. Uh, uh, but it's certainly, as you'll see later on when we look at our research, um, a significant issue for many people who've been through the care system. But um, from, from what we've said already, it should be obvious why that, that would be the case. Um, okay, uh, that's enough on that slide, I think. We'll move on to the next one. Uh, yeah, I, I think this, this summarizes the, the issues in relation to adults. Um, as you, it's it's worth saying, if you look at the the population of children who enter the care system, uh, and I've been doing some work on this recently. As you would imagine, large numbers of them come from very disadvantaged, poor households. Uh, obviously, in terms of poor people as a whole, it's a very small percentage, but there are their, their backgrounds do tend to be more advantaged than most. There have always been. Uh, a small minority of, uh, I suppose, what you, you call the middle class children who enter the care system, because middle class families too have problems with mental health and drugs and so forth that may lead to family breakdown. But by, by and large, it's people who from, are from already economically and socially disadvantaged backgrounds, and that often continues into adult life. And you can see there um, uh, the Sakharatal research, Meltzer, we are now getting hard data on the impact on mortality, and it's quite significant that care leavers um, are far, have far, far worse mortality data. Um, uh, and the ONS data, it's quite extensive, as you can imagine, from the Office of National Statistics. Um, it speaks for itself. This is a group that right across the life course, um, is more likely to suffer various health consequences. Um, not always connected to their time in care, sometimes just connected to the, the initial very difficult circumstances of their very early life before they went into care. Um, so that gives you, again, a bit more of a picture of what we're talking about here. Um, we'll move on to the, the next slide. Uh, and this is where we start to focus for a little while 
on the research that the CLA did between 2014 and 2017. We were we were funded by the Department of Health, which was which was very quite visionary of them at the time because they recognised that this was an area that they'd not really um, taken cognizance of, um, and they funded us to work with, as you can see, ten clinical commissioning groups. Um, but also to do a survey of prof health professionals and care experienced people of all ages. So this is what we're looking at the findings of. We were quite um, surprised that we got such a good response um, because it was uh, we 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 didn't have the resources to do a huge push for it. But nevertheless, we got 418 care leavers care responding, and this was again of all ages. Um, we did partnership seminars with professionals in, in the 10 areas. Um, I went to one in South, South Tees, and th there was myself, David, and Jacob Braden, who I'll mention later on, he was central to this project. He was the worker we appointed to do the work, um, to do the, 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 the basic work. Uh, and that, that South Tees seminar was just fantastic. We had about maybe 40, 50 health professionals in the room all looking at the initial data and talking about what, what they thought the issues were. We'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Uh, I should add, um, we got a lot of data. You can download the full full report. There's actually a lot more data than is in the report, but the full report's on the CLA website if you, if you do want to download it. It's important to remember, and I always like to stress this as an academic, um, this isn't a representative sample in the sense that it's random. People people choose to respond to our questionnaire. So we're not saying at all that 76, 78 percent of care leavers are suffering from these these experiences. Um, that's only the percentage who responded to our questionnaire who were suffering from these experiences. What it does tell us, though, given the numbers and given the reach of the questionnaire, is that this is a significant issue for a, a large number of people who've been in care. It also, I should add a separate note, it does kind of complement the general work of the CLA that we do all the time. I mean, I, I um, uh, run Zoom sessions for once a month for people who've been care experienced. And David and I and other people have helped with phone calls and people who want our support. And there are significant numbers of care leavers who are dealing with issues of isolation um, that relates to... Um, their care experience uh, and depression and so forth. But we'll come back to that a bit later on. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we did, um, with the clinical conditioning con uh, commissioning groups, um, we got 215 respondents there, as you can see. And these were the issues. And this was what they recognised from their practice, if you like. Now, in a sense, the people who responded are likely to be health professionals that were already interested in this issue and engaged. I mean, they're going to fill in a questionnaire response that tells you tells you that straight away. And they noted these issues. And as you can see, some of them are mental health issues. Some of them are to do with addictions. But there are some general physical health issues as well. Um, I should add, um, the, the area of need, um, this is probably worth flagging up there, when it refers to transitions between services, the big issue, certainly at that point, was the transition between um, child and adolescent mental health services and adult services. There were often problems in that uh, transition from children's to adult services. Um, there have always been physical health issues. If you go right back to the 1940s, one of the ways in which this issue got highlighted, uh, which led to the 1948 Children Act, were people noticing the difference between children in care in homes very often then and other children. And it was obviously physically um, quite clear that some of these children who were overweight, who were lacking in exercise, um, they just physically looked different um, from other children in schools. Um, OK, so we'll move on to the, to the next slide. Now, this is uh, by way of an introduction to uh, the bit of our presentation where we're going to invite you to discuss 
some of what we've found and some of what care leavers have been telling us. Um, Jacob Braden, who I mentioned earlier on, um, who sadly died uh, 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 a year, well, what year and a, a bit ago now, actually, more like a year and a half, um, worked with us very extensively in this project. And this was his baby, this this 45 care leave of friendly ways pamphlets that he produced. It was essentially based on what care leavers were saying about how um, not just health professionals, but others should deal with them when it comes to dealing with health health issues. Uh, it was a guide to uh, working with care leavers of all ages. Um, and it was a very interesting uh, response that we got um, to this uh, pamphlet when we've given it out to people. It's, it was one of our most popular downloads, for example. Uh, and when we, we give it out, people tend to pick it up and, and use it. Um, whereas the report, they tend to just read, um, absorb the lessons, and then move on a little bit. Um, so the next bit, what we're going to do, uh, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, there are seven of these slides which take you through um, um, the, 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 the booklets. And one of the reasons we included this was we wanted both Howard and I to give you a chance to engage with us, to ask questions, and to um, comment on the sort of things that Kelly was told us around health. So I'm going to go through the first two, and I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to go through all of the points made on these uh, slides. Um, uh, I'm going to pick out a couple, but you, you can obviously read them yourselves. And then we're just going to invite you in the chat, or even if you, if, if, if there's scope for it, um, just to ask us questions or make comments. And uh, if, if there's nobody, if it works, we'll try unmuting your mic so you can just you just ask us questions about it. Um, I should say that the the, pic, the people in the pictures are people who work with us on the health project. Um, that's why they're there. Uh, so from this one, I'm just going to pick out a couple of points which I think are quite important. Um, uh, that second point um, about not assuming that young people in care or adults, in fact, were in care because they were in trouble, that they were themselves were troubled. It's quite an important one. I've kind of lost count of the number of adult care leavers who, who tell me that when they admit, if you like, or confess, as they often term it, to people that they were in care, one of the most common questions is, what were you in for? As though they were put in care for a reason to do with their behaviour. If you go back to that data I mentioned, that pie chart around reasons for admission to care, the, the behaviour of the child is routinely um, three or four percent, very rarely more than five percent of the reason for admission to care is to do with the actual behavior of the child, that they're uncontrollable or, or, or something else. Uh, one of the great things about that video that we saw um, uh, from John Lewis is before it came out, I should say a lot of people, care leavers I knew, were kind of slightly dreading it. They were thinking, are they going to get this wrong? Because um, people who've been in care are so used to being stereotyped. And the, 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 the response was almost universally positive. It was kind of a wave of relief and a sense of feeling for some people, particularly those who've been in foster care, validated that their lives had been uh, made visible to the UK population, particularly at Christmas time, which can be difficult for the care leavers. Um, the second point I want to make from this slide is is that very often care leavers are used to keeping quiet about their care experience. And that might mean that in a patient context, things that from their past that are relevant to their present health may not get raised. But that doesn't mean that they're necessarily embarrassed or don't want to talk about it. It may just mean uh, that, as, as Jackie kind of says there, well, well, this is not just Jackie's comment, this is the comments of other people as well, that asking questions about their time in care may be relevant. And if it is relevant, then that you should essentially feel you can go ahead with that. So are there any points that anybody wants to make about anything on that slide, or indeed anything that we've, we've raised so far? Um, I'm going to suggest that in the first instance, people put it in the chat because then it might make it easier for, for myself or Howard, depending on the question, to respond. Or if anybody wants to just unmute and say something because it's 
it's quite cool. You're not you're not obligated to speak, but it's just an opportunity for you to do so. Or shall I just move on to the next slide? I should add as well, we did say at the start that if you if you do have any general questions, we'll try and make time at the end for them as well for a bit of a discussion. All right, do you want to make sure we move on to the next slide? We, we do have a we do have a oh. hand up. Um, oh, okay. sorry, I can't see the hands, but you yeah, carry on, Jess. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm listening with great interest. So I work in Buckinghamshire. And um, a little while ago, our corporate parenting panel <clears throat> asked us to demonstrate more um, overtly how we captured, reported on the views of the, the young people that we are in the business of trying to support. And I have to say, on the one hand, whilst we might be conceited enough to think we do it all the time, it's not always that straightforward to do. Um, and I wonder if that's any part of today's presentation or not? Um, I, I think probably Howard's in a better position to comment. So it's, it's not in the presentation as such, but that difficulty of recording care experience, um, particularly in social social work or health settings, um, I'm not familiar with how it's done. Are you are you aware, Howard, at all, or any thoughts on that? But certainly in terms of care experience and care leavers, it's not something that we capture at the moment within the NHS. And I see something there in the chat as well about you know, the, the discussion and debate about uh, care leaver becoming a protected characteristic, which we do talk about later. And that is one of the um, sort of the recommendations as well, isn't it, from the care review? But yes, um, certainly within the NHS. Uh, and, and I think that's the biggest thing is that actually we don't know. Um, who is care experienced as you know as, as we were talking about you know there's almost that feeling of sense of shame and and you know people don't want to always own up and talk about it because you feel as if you know the reason why you're in care was because you've done something wrong or you know what you experienced was your fault so um so so I think it's a really um really sensitive uh, subject but at the same time you know i think we've got to be exploring how do we support people to to share that they are care experience so that we can then support them in their health thank you thank you to me it speaks to point number one we, our role is to support not do more harm or do one too and how can we improve our services and responses unless we hear firsthand in a meaningful way not a key performance indicator type way but thank you oh we love a kpi in the nhs oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks, thanks Jenny. Um, we've also sorry to interrupt we've also had one comment in the chat from claire who said that it's really good to reflect on as a professional to be considerate of this a reminder as to our role for care leavers oh thanks claire um that's really helpful um that's good to know uh uh i i think probably jess if you if you if you're able to keep an eye on the, the yellow hands going up that's great fantastic uh we'll move on to the next slide um uh, i i should uh in relation to the previous comment before i go into this it's worth mentioning uh my experience in higher education is that for example when care leavers enter he they're supposed to declare well they're asked they're invited to declare that they're a care leaver because then that then they can be offered extra help um, and it's routinely known in HE that large numbers of young people do not do this. Um, and obviously, one of the things they're doing is they're saying, I want a fresh start. I do not want to be identified to anybody as a care experienced young person. Now, obviously, that can be particularly related to young people being 18 and wanting to escape from their past. Um, so there's an element of it being a teenage thing, but there's an, also an element of saying that was the past. I'm, I'm moving on generally. But, and here's an interesting point, sometimes the past comes back. So it may be that at a particular point, a care experienced person does not want to engage with their past. But later on, sometimes decades later on in their life, they do, because the connections to their presence somehow become more uh, obvious, more overt. Um, so uh, I've got a question sorry, comments in, 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 in the chat, but I'll come back to that later, later on. There were a couple, a few things I wanted to highlight from this slide. Um, uh, the first one is, is, is point nine about relationships. 
Uh, one of the things to remember, particularly about older adults who are in residential care, some of these older adults will have been in the old institutions. The big old institutions run by nuns, et cetera, and with you know, 50 and 100 children. We often think of them as part of history, and they are, but the people who lived in them are still around. They may be elderly now. In the, I mean, even I was in what, in big institutions run by nuns in the 60s. And those those institutions survived through the 70s and in some cases into the 80s. Um, so anybody older than me, there's a good chance that they were in those institutions. In those institutions, they only worked by children being obedient and quiet. You cannot have normal family life with 50 children. So there was a premium on obedience, a, a, pre, a premium on compliance, uh, a premium on following orders, and a premium on not making a noise and getting upset. Uh, if that translates in any way through characteristics into adult life, then those people are more likely to take time to trust and more likely to open up than, for example, a child who's been raised in the to and throw, the cut and trust, the spontaneity, if you like, of family life. So that's one point to bear in mind. Point 12 about hobbies. Um, this may not be particularly relevant to your work, but it is relevant to, in particular, to mental health issues in general. One of my favorite pieces of research, um, and unfortunately I can't remember the reference, but it's it's by um, a, a, a woman called Anne Buchanan, who I think was at Cambridge or Oxford, and it was written two or three decades ago now. And she looked at depression rates amongst care leavers, and she found that it was the care leavers at the age of 33, um, she was using national child development data, were more likely to be depressed than any other group, even than single parents. But one of the most interesting findings she, she noted was that the care leavers who had hobbies or pastimes, sports, games, whatever it was, were more likely to be insulated from depression and isolation. And that stands to reason. Um, so encouraging people's social activities through sports and hobbies, as some of you will know uh, better than I, is a very, very important aspect of people's mental health and where it's been engaged with in the care system. Um, and I certainly benefited from this and many other people will have. Um, it's a huge, huge social advantage um, that can be lifelong. Life uh, interest; these interests can be can 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 last um, for a very very long uh, period of time. The four, the final four, point fourteen. There, I wanted to say something about uh, before we look at any comments and questions. Um, isolation, particularly um, at weekends and at Christmas and other other point other points, can be particularly acute for people from the care system. And this was brought home to me um, in relation to Kelly was going into hospital. And I know this isn't by no means specific just to care leavers, but they are more likely to not have family and therefore not have visitors uh, simply because of their the, the disruption to their background. Um, uh, you will already be used as health professionals to patients who haven't got those family ties and those fam the, the family support networks that to, to rely on. But, but Kelly was certainly in that bracket, or some of them certainly are. Um, others, of course, have, have made fantastic transitions to normal family life, for want of a way, of, way of putting it, and have the same support mechanisms as the rest of us. But that risk of isolation, both in the home, but also in, in hospital and in healthcare situations, is quite real. So I don't know whether anybody wants to ask any questions or make any comments about any of that. Um, I've got I've noticed in the um, uh, chat over oh, oh, from Jess. Yes, absolutely. Uh, we also have Kelly was um, uh, who are parents and therefore we now have adults whose parents were in care. And in some cases that will have been, as Jess has pointed out, in those institutions uh, run by nuns. Yes, ex uh, exactly the points uh, I was making. Um, let's just see if there's anything else in the chat that's worth 
uh, commented on. I'm slightly losing track about where we, which ones were commented on and which which no, I have. Sorry, we're, we're keeping a note as we go. Um, there's yeah, there's some great engagement, and I think one of the main questions Howard said will be picked up um, later on in the slides as well. So um, if if you want me to pose questions, just prompt me, and I'll, I'll I'll keep you updated. So don't feel you need to keep an eye on that chat as well. I know how difficult it is to do both. <laughs> okay, I will I will try and keep an eye on it. Um, and if there's anything you think I've I've missed, Jess, do flag it up for me. Um, I think Howard's doing the next couple of slides, so I'll hand over to yeah. him. And, and I think what we do, because I'm just conscious it's 20 past two, so we've only got about 40 minutes left, and there's quite a bit that we still want to go through and also discuss about what this means for health. I just what we just do, I think, with the next slides is just to pause and just let people just take these in. These are the voices from care leavers from the project that Jim was talking earlier on and just want you just to have a look at these slides and just read them. And I think for me, I think the key and you'll hear within my story is around that the practice support is really important, but um, like we talked about that cliff edge, which was being talked about earlier on and that transition. So that support is that emotional support that people need that sometimes isn't there. You know, we want to be cared for, we want to be loved. And, you know, and that's sometimes what we, certainly what I wanted as, as a child as well. And definitely about not being given up on. OK, can we move to the next slide? We're keen to give you a five minute breather before we continue to see, because we know what it's like sitting in front of the screen. Um, and this is Jacob, who Jim was talking about earlier on, who did a lot of the work on this project. Um, so we'll testimony to, to him. Um, and I think, you know, we know as well in terms of the individual care that we want to provide as health professionals, you know, we talk about individual care, we need to listen to people um, and hear people's stories. Um, do we have the time to do that? Um, big question mark, isn't it, in the NHS? And I think item 28 there, um, we can't always relate to what family is, how we understand family, what our experience of all that is. Um, how we hear other people's stories of their own family and when we hear you know what somebody's doing with their family how that can make us feel as well because it's you know it, it scratches that surface for us and next slide okay um i i am uh, as as uh, Howard is conscious of the time and conscious that you, to give you a, a little bit of a breather, but there's one or two points from these next two slides. I did again. I just wanted to flag up um, to to mention to you about while you're reading them. Uh, um, point thirty two is quite significant. Um, obviously, um, many of us, anybody, can have trust issues with people in authority. Um, and it's by no means the case that all people who've been in the care system will have, um, particularly if they've had a very good experience. But some of them may have, um, because they will have had not only in their lives when as children will they have had uh, carers who started off as strangers and not their family, but they will also very often have already experienced quite a lot of professionals in their lives. Um, they will be used to uh, to, to dealing with some good professionals, some okay professionals, some negative um, and uh, inadequate professionals occasionally. Uh, and that may color their experience uh, in engaging with professionals in adult life. It may not, but it's just, it's something to bear in mind. And it also relates to one, some of the comments in the chat about care, Kelly was not wanting to declare themselves and not wanting to uh, come out for want of a way of putting it. Um, they absolutely, as somebody said, have a right to do that. Um, but sometimes that's just a resistance to being pigeonholed or stereotyped and a resistance to how professionals uh, treat them. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Uh, and the, the point the points I picked out here for comments, um, it relates to the points I made earlier, particularly about people 
post up in institutions. Um, there's a premium on being quiet and obedient in institutions, um, and that can persist. Um, so if we are dealing with people who are quiet and don't, for want of a way of putting, well, better way of putting it, um, vocalize, verbalize, other, otherwise act out distress or unhappiness, um, that may be simply to do with their background. I'm not, I'm not saying, I don't want to be too deterministic or reductive about this, um, but it goes back to the point Jackie made earlier on that, that finding out, just simply finding out something a bit more about somebody's background um, with, in the case of care leavers, if they're willing to talk about it, can help to explain how they are in the present. Obviously, we all change as we grow up and, and we can change ourselves. Uh, and it's fantastic that as human beings, we can do that. But character is something that does persist. And it is something that begins to be developed at a very, very young age. So um, uh, then the, the next slide, and it is the final slide, I think, before we have a bit of a break. Uh, this is Jackie. Jackie was another participant in the health project. Um, and uh, uh, both Jackie's worked very, very well with Jacob. Um, uh, and they were very happy to be to be included in this brochure. Um, as, as I say, these comments are generic. They're not particularly Jackie's. They're, they're from everybody who participated. But two of these points uh, stood out for me. Um, let me give you an example of the exclusion from decisions. Uh, most people um, who are parents uh, probably tear their hair out at the number of questions they get asked, particularly at a young age, by their children. There was a routine dialogue, often uh, mind-numbing, sometimes infuriating, but always lovable, between parents and children. Um, children in care very often, particularly from older generations, did not experience that. And I'll give you an example of my personal experience, but it's universal at, the, at that age. Um, the National Association of Young People in Care, which campaigned for children's rights in the care system in the 80s, um, some of the work that they did had been done earlier. And one of the important things for them was voice. Um, every child in care, even now, has a six monthly review. It was, an, it was it's, it's part of the law. Um, they get, every, the professionals get together, decisions are made and their progress and their happiness is generally discussed. It's basically a meeting of all the key professionals and their carers. Um, in the 1970s, for the first time, it was deemed appropriate that children should be invited to attend those reviews. Um, but they didn't do it before they were teenagers. I remember my first review, I was about 14. Uh, I was invited in. I was shocked that these meetings took place. Um, and I was invited in at the end of the meeting to give my comments so they could talk to me about how happy I was. The single biggest thing I remember from that meeting was the shock I had that my school teacher was in the room because I thought naively that I'd hidden my care, care past from every, or my care of life actually as it then was from everybody in school. And I got away with it by lying through my teeth and inventing a family whenever it, the need arose. But no, my teacher was there. It was very embarrassing. Um, and, and they ask you, you know, are things going okay? And you either you're honest or in my case, you lie because the person who's making it not okay is in the room. Um, but the point I'm making there is that was the first point at which the care system decided we need to hear from these young people their version of what their life is like. Even social workers at that point didn't routinely speak to children on their own. It did happen. Some good social workers would make a point of taking a child out for a walk or in their car to talk to them about their lives. So compare that to family life. Again, that contrast between the cut and thrust, the to and fro, the spontaneousness of family life, and large numbers of adults for whom consultation, even in the 70s, was a new and innovative thing that people regarded as wildly progressive. Now it's a lot more common, which is great, um, but it's not going to equate to the, again, to the level of uh, back and forth that you get in family life. So uh, hopefully that's given you loads to think about. Um, uh, I'm tempted to say, bearing in mind the time, 
that if anybody does want to make a quick comment, feel free, but we probably need to go into our quick five minute break. Um, if, if that's, if that, does that sound okay? Jess Howard or yeah. anything that anything, I can't see anything. There's anything else that's, uh, so there's been some reflections in the chat. So Natalie said that she was referring to the review meetings that you were talking um, to. Ah. Um, in those meetings, they only want to talk about what's good. Don't actually make sense to give honest feedback. Um, and Alison responded to that to say that they always hated mine, really difficult experiences or to discuss difficulties is what Natalie said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's very even now. Inevitably, there, there, there are, there's an element of theatre about those kind of meetings, um, and it, it's yeah, it's difficult. Um, so hopefully, everyone's had a chance just to give those bodies a bit of a stretch before we continue. Um, we love sitting in front of our screens, don't we, all day now on Teams calls or whatever. So it's important we we keep active as well. Um, so I hopefully that's been really helpful and, and interesting in terms of just some of the information obviously that we've gone through so far. Um, and I'm just going to change a bit of a direction now. So we've sort of been building up really. We've talked about some data. We've talked about some research. You've heard from the research as well in terms of those stories. Um, and what I'm now going to do is actually talk about my story. Um, and something we should have just picked up, I think, right at the beginning of the presentation and something that I have done before is just recognising that I don't know people's stories and the people that we have today with us here. I don't know your histories. I don't know if what I'm, we're talking about is triggering anything for anybody that's here. So we talk about that, so that gaslighting. Um, and I'm conscious that there will be people here that either it'll it, it'll relate to your own experience or you have a direct experience as well so i'm just recognizing that we've also talked about you know the health inequalities um and about you know worse health inequalities or outcomes or you know the percentage of the prison population who are care experienced but also when people are given opportunities and myself as care experienced i've been given those opportunities and what that's helped me to do is to release what are termed my, I believe, these superpowers. I pinched that from a from a from a, a, a colleague of mine who's also care experienced. Those helped me to release my superpowers, and I believe that I really now thrive. So I've shifted in terms of how I see my past. It has made me who I am. Maybe I have survived at times in my life, whilst now I've shifted into thinking more. That actually I've now thrived and um, you know I had those opportunities then in terms of doing my nurse training my health visitor training career within the NHS the amazing experience and and, and the friends that I've created from being part of the Florence Nightingale Foundation scholarship um, and a lovely photo there of the graduation um, my amazing husband um, you know we've been together uh, 23 years um, and is my real rock um, and, you know, so I just want to really flag that actually there's some really positive stories as well. So I'm just going to talk about my story, though, that led me now into care and how I feel as a care leaver. Um, so next slide. Next slide, there you go. And as Jim was talking earlier on, there are multiple reasons why a child enters care. And I have put this photo up and I'm going to be really open and honest and I'm going to be sharing some really personal things with you this afternoon. And I feel very comfortable about doing that because I believe that going forward for the rest of my life, I want to make sure that I'm raising awareness of care experience and how can we can reduce that inequalities. And I want to be using my story positively. And for me, this was my experience of my childhood. So in my uh, my birth family, um, I would do this literally. I would have a door. I would have a, a chair that was underneath the handle. I had a cabin bed where I used to hide underneath the cabin bed with the desk pulled in. And then I would be hiding underneath the bed. So no one could then come in. Experienced and saw a lot of domestic violence. Police weren't interested because it was a domestic. 
that uh, mum experienced quite, you know, quite severe. Fortunately, I was then left with my father um, and then the abuse then turned on to me. Came to quite a head, um, police involvement, um, and, and I was then taken into care at the age of 14. But the experience and the reasons why I was entering care had really started from about the age of five. So we talked to anyone about those adverse childhood experiences. So there was that abuse that I was experienced, but also then how I was taken into care and how at that time, both the police and social services didn't believe my story. And how I would then um, was, it, it was agreed that I could remain in care was by a social worker um, taking me to my natural father who had been voluntarily sectioned uh, at the age of 14, sitting in uh, Graylingwell, which is the main local um, mental health hospital, and saying to my father that I didn't want to live with him anymore. And that's what I had to do at the age of 14. Otherwise, I was going to have to remain living with him. And that was, you know, that, that was in the, in, in the 1980s. Next slide. And we talked to anyone about that transition period. No, so I was really fortunate. I was with a foster family who actually was one of the neighbours. Um, lovely, you know, really great. And have they've remained as my mum and dad, as you they you saw them in the photo earlier. But that cliff edge, which again somebody talked about in the chat in, in the in the chat function there, you know, that that um that period between 18 and, and onwards into early adulthood. It's a real time of change, isn't it? Imagine, you know, sort of leaving home and going to university. And if you've been brought up within a traditional family and then compare that to, you know, being in a foster home or being in foster care and, and those experiences. So real mixed feelings. And next slide. And sometimes it can feel like this. You can feel alone that there's nobody there to support you. I um, was talking to somebody else who had um, was doing their nurse training and, you know, they didn't have anybody. They didn't have, um, you know, a member of family to look at their essays for them. Obviously there was their tutor, but they didn't have anybody. So what could we be doing more to support people? And sometimes it can just feel alone, that emotional support, there is more practical support available now, but actually it's that emotional support that you know people need far you know, far longer. Um, I still know in my 50, I am now 50. Um, um the, the, the support that I get from my foster parents, you know, who I call mum and dad, you know, is incredible. But not everybody is experiencing that. Next slide. And for me, and again, something that, um, you know, we talked about earlier on is that sometimes the issues and the reasons why somebody was in care, they, those issues and the reasons why can sometimes impact later on in life. And for me, um, I was sitting on a train coming back from Brighton and I was looking at the news and for me my world suddenly collapsed so this wasn't that many years ago because what I read on the news um, it really related to an experience that I'd had whilst I was in care and this is sometimes how I feel you know I think we all have that we know we talk about imposter syndrome um, but I think you know for me you know that 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 chair underneath the the um the, the door handle is sometimes where I go back to if I'm responding in a situation or responding in terms of um, something at work or something within my own life where I can sometimes feel myself is back as a child I'm responding because I'm experiencing that trauma and for me, you know, sometimes it, you know, as, as you know, Jim was talking earlier on that, you know, I'm, I mustn't make a mistake. I've got to do the best I can when I was with my foster family. And still now those feelings of insecurity is something going to be taken away from me. Um, and that does relate in terms of my work environment as well. Next slide. 
So I think that we've got a real opportunity for the NHS. Obviously, we've spoken quite a bit already about the data and the reasons why this is an inequality. But you now we need to be thinking about how are we supporting people? How are we giving people that opportunity to come and work within the NHS? How are we supporting that recruitment, that support for members of staff throughout their life? As you've heard about my story, you know, the reasons why I was in care, but then what the experiences I had whilst I was in care, that support is often needed then later on in our in, in our own um, in our own lives. Inequality, looking at the data we talked earlier on about, you know, protected characteristics. Do we really know how many people are, are care experienced and, and what support we should be giving them? That transition between children and young people and adult services, but also then the services that we're offering. How many people are aware of the health needs of care experience? Are our services providing what's needed? So leaving these sort of questions there for you about thinking about what the opportunities that we have in the NHS. We've recently, and Alison I know is here on, on the call as well, has set up a care experience peer group, which I'm linked with. And, and that's, that, that's part of you know, why I'm here today as well. We've got a future forums platform because what we want to do is try to encourage people who are supportive of this agenda, but also to be able to support other care experience staff um, through, the, through the peer group. And next slide. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we're moving. Uh, thanks for that, Howard. Uh, I think we're, we're moving back a little bit from that uh, personal testimony about the imp the the impact of, of care experience into the, the the wider picture. And the the key word in this slide to me is the word invisible. Uh, when Josh McAllister started his review of the of, of what was supposed to be a review of the care system turned out turned into a bigger review around child protection and children's services um you got the sense that this for him was a bit of a revelation and he was finding out things that anybody who's been involved in the care system for a number of well years uh just takes for granted uh, the level of disadvantage along a number of different dimensions i'll give you an example some of you, uh, well, most of you probably are old enough to remember the new Labour government of 90, 1997 to 2010. Uh, when the new Labour government set up its social exclusion unit, because that was a big thing for them back then, the first three reports of that social exclusion unit were on uh, rough sleeping, teenage pregnancy and truancy and school exclusion. And care leave was featured very heavily in all three of them. That's just one example of, the, of what happens when government actually focuses on this topic and it realizes what the issues are. Um, it's, it is a bit of a revelation, but generally speaking, for most of the time, it can be pretty invisible. So uh, next slide. Thanks. So we're coming towards the end of the um of the session and i think you know what we really wanted to do was sort of open up these two questions really about so you know you've heard some stories you've heard some of the outcomes from the research you've heard my own personal story and you know that slide where i was showing in terms of those lovely circles about um you know what the um what does this mean for us in the nhs what is it that we could be doing and thinking about care leavers accessing services as well, um, and also for our own staff who might be care leavers. So just want to open that up and people, you know, please, you know, um, put your hand up or, or um, put some comments in the chat about what do you think that we could now be doing? Um, and I can see Jilly's raised her hand. Jilly. Thank you very much. I think the NHS is a huge employer. And I think so part of what we're supposed to be doing now is integrated care boards is this whole addressing this whole aspect of reducing health inequalities but as an enormous employer there must be opportunities really pertinent opportunities for those still in the care system and care leavers to be able to offer really insightful and valuable support so it feels like it should be one of those in inverted commas quick wins but I'm not sure I couldn't identify what the barriers are, but I sense that there are barriers. I'm interested to hear what others might think about that. Thanks, Jenny. 
So what other people, we've got some other people to raise their hand. So Mary's also raised her hand. Hi, Howard and Jim. I, I, one of the things that I was reflecting on as you were talking was um, how children in care going into adult life are likely to access services, you know, thinking about that question that you've put up there, because in my previous experience as a, a midwife and a health visitor, we know that there are groups of people who don't access for instance, medical services in the same way. And that can be everything from really straightforward drop-in clinics, groups. Um, and I'm thinking about the, the groups that we know that find that difficult, including um, gay couples, uh, Roma, gypsy and traveling families, um, any sort of, you know, slightly more marginalized group within that local community don't access services in the same way. Um, I'm making a big assumption here that that also might apply to care leavers. But if you've got any evidence of that, that throughout the life, the adult life of a care leaver, that that might still be a stumbling block. Even GP appointments, things like that. Yes, I mean, definitely, Mary. I mean, I think in terms of that access, but also the, you know, how people can potentially view the professional as well um, from the experiences that we might have had as well. Um, you know, and, you know, talking earlier, actually, with some of the uh, children in care team within within the um, Sussex community and, you know, that that transition bit and, and doing the, uh, the health assessments and then that um, that support in terms of the that transition period and helping people to access health you know we talk about like a corporate parenting role as well and I think mm -hmm. for me there's something about the NHS you know I I still do rely on my my mum my, my and dad my foster parents and um, to support me and to help me in um, accessing um, and I talk about how I feel and about my health um, and actually the NHS is something for me, I think that, you know, as the NHS, I think we need to be thinking about what role do we have to help people to talk more about their health um, as care leavers ourselves. Yeah. We have Anyone? another hand up um, from Jifundu. Apologies if I've pronounced your name wrong. Please do correct me. No, you got it right. Yeah. So, hi. So basically, first of all, thank you so much. What an amazing session. I'm glad that I signed up for it. Oh, and I've you. learned a lot, honestly speaking. And what I was going to say is, and I think somebody has actually already touched on it in the chat, but it's about finding a way of get, getting care livers while they're still in care to engage with us more so that we build that trust that doesn't exist at the moment so that when they do leave care we've already got a relationship going so that it shouldn't be an issue that's yeah. one thing that i'd like to add and i think we the nhs health professionals need to sort of like really make an effort and engage with them you know what i mean we need to go to where they are and meet them so that we can identify what we, they need from us and then deliver. And it should be like a priority in my eyes, because honestly speaking, I mean, it, I'm shocked that it's happening uh, and we need to do something about it. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you, Chifunta. Thank you. That's great. And I think, you know, I think a key message from today is about, you know, encouraging people to talk about this more um and raising awareness of this as a health inequality and that it is it is the civil i believe it's it's one of the civil rights issues of our time when we're talking about the thousands of people that have left care and how you know care experience sometimes people have felt very let, let down by the system or by their families and and how can we ensure now that that we're not repeating that later on in someone's life um, and as you've heard and from the stories and from my own personal story and also you know in terms of gyms that you know the, the experience of being in care doesn't just suddenly stop at 18 it's something that is lifelong it's you know it's after the age of 25. I know earlier there was um, a, a comment Jim, from, from Claire around in the health reviews, the voice of the child. And there's been um, some discussion in the chat function as well about that 
that voice obviously thanking you Howard for your um sharing your story but I just wondered if you wanted to touch on that point um yeah yeah but I'll keep it very brief because I'm conscious of the time I mean actually it was it was not just Claire's comment but I think Jean that was about services in Bradford but also Jean's comments about services in Surrey and it was really just an emphasis that there is good practice out there and things are improving and there, are, there is that you will find lots of examples of of, of quite a, a high degree of sensitivity about what what may, what enables young people and indeed older people to talk about very very personal and difficult experiences. And I, I also noticed Natalie's comments in the chat about about what she calls the the game changing approach of her GP in allowing her to open up about and learn to trust and open up about her experiences. And I think I'm 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 very. I sometimes you do get comments about about uh, not just about the care experience but other areas that nothing's ever changed and nothing's ever nothing's ever getting better. But actually, there are things do get better, uh, and you can find examples of it. And I wouldn't want people to feel that 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 you know it's 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 an endless battle. Um, the the children's rights agenda of the 1990s and beyond has made a big difference. Um, and professionals have responded in some cases really, really well to that that change in culture in relation to how to, how we interact with children. So I think it was that really it's just to point out that the the that we we tend to focus on things that are going wrong and things that need doing, but there's also a, it's also worth pointing out a lot of the good things that are already going on. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. So I think if we could just move on to the next slide, because I'm conscious it's five to three um, and not going to go through this because, again, just just aware of coming towards the end of our time. Um, but as um, Jim was just talking about there, you know, there is change happening. Um, there are conversations happening about protected characteristic looking at services up to 25 and and, and as we were looking at the chat as well afterwards um and you know a lot of talk as well now about trauma-informed care and do we really understand about trauma and let's understand as well what that person's experience is within the nhs um and obviously you know from our you know, jim and i and others experiences you know the you know the pa role that that care lever has um, you know, that that wasn't in place uh, in the past or that financial support. Um, I think I got given 20 quid when I left care and that was about it. Um, you know, but actually there's more practical support now and actually it, it's understanding what those issues are. So real positive change happening. Um, and what we really want to do is now we hear that further. So if we move to the next slide. So. What we really want in terms of those opportunities, um, and I shared my, you know, the fact that I was given opportunities and other people here as well who have, and, you know, we have really thrived. Um, and we do have these superpowers that I alluded to earlier. You know, there's a real sense of resilience, you know, you know, the, the experiences that we have has made, made us really strong. Um, you know, real tenacity, wanting to see things through, you know, conversations today, you know, have been great. Um, being very adaptable because you know we've had to adapt to different situations or you know maybe moved at different times you know in a year being able to be flexible but also really loyal as well uh, real loyalty in terms of you know our teams and and, and the organization that we work with oh well thanks natalie <laughs> and i that, that's a, not a photo of me at all either that's um my chest does not look like that. Um, and next slide. So there is some, you know, thinking about the future as well. Um, I don't know how many people are aware that NHS England last year signed up to the Care Leavers Covenant, which is amazing. That's looking at improving access to careers, but also about increasing awareness of the health needs of care leavers. Um, and I have the real privilege as part of the Care Experience Peer Group um, sitting on the National Steering Committee for that rollout. Um, and there are um, some um, ICBs around the country that are part of the pilot around that rollout this year. And it's going to be sort of ramping up over the next three years. So you, hopefully you will hear more of that. But also the learning from those pilot sites as well, we're going to be share, shared across. And obviously I've mentioned as well in terms of the care experience peer group that, um, that Alison's set up, who's on the on the um, 
call today. So there is stuff happening nationally, and there's also lots of local projects as well locally. Um, and what I would really love to see, and something that I've been trying to advocate and linking in with some of the national teams, is actually somebody within the NHS that's able to really support and harness all of this together so that we can really understand from the NHS, this is the direction we want to go and bringing together all these, these amazing projects that are, that are happening. Uh, next slide. So thank you. Um, and really important to thank you for your time today, uh, obviously for the Florence Nightingale Foundation and the support. But to thank you and, you know, listening to us and taking away from here today um, some, some key messages. So it's a thank you from all the children and young people who are in care now. And all those children, and young people who leave care every year. And I think I felt quite nervous coming on and doing this because I almost felt a sense of responsibility to these children and young people because, you know, we wanted to make sure that we got this message across in a way that was going to be beneficial and, and helping with, it, with that future. So thank you, everyone. And next slide. Next slide. So just asking you really to think about, and maybe this will come as part of the um, the feedback as well about what is that you're, what will you commit to today? Is it that you're going to look at some of the research? And we've got the um, references here, talking to your, um, you know, your leads locally, thinking about the practice and thinking about the services that we provide. So just want you to think about just one thing from today that you are going to commit to. And next slide. Brilliant. And then there's our contact details. Um, so really happy for people to contact us. Um, and we've got the link there as well for the um, for the Futures Forum as well. Brilliant. And I think the next slide has got the references on, which always everyone always loves, don't they? A nice reference list. Yeah, just to add, as I, as I mentioned, some of those, you have a rummage online, you can actually find copies you can download of several of them, and they are well worth reading. Um, I'd just like to add to Howard's uh, appreciation. I mean, I just want to thank you all for turning up because you've all taken time out of your day, uh, presumably a busy day, um, to find out more about the subject. So for me, uh, that's just uh, fantastic um, because anybody who's interested in the, in in care leavers young or old uh, and their health issues um it's 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 what we you know what we're trying to generate really and yeah so i just really appreciate your attendance and engagement with this with this subject brilliant thank you everyone Thank you so much both. Um, that was absolutely brilliant and thank you for uh, bringing your stories as well and a huge thanks, uh, I will repeat it, um, on behalf of FNF to all of our uh, members of the audience today who have enjoyed who have joined us and engaged in various ways as well and we do hope um, we can continue the conversation online and through our various networks we've popped um, in the chat the social media handles for both the care leaders association and for howard as well so please do connect with them um, on over on twitter and we will share the resources mentioned in the follow-up email shortly after so you'll have all of those as well so don't worry about scribbling down and I know I'm like that well taking a quick print screen you will get those resources too so you can further explore but um for now uh it is farewell from us at FNF and we hope to see you all very soon thanks all